Humans like neat boxes, one box for plants that stand in sunlight and turn air and water into sugar, another for animals that move and eat. When we meet something that breaks those boxes, we do not forget it. The first time a diver lifted a bright green leaf from a salt marsh and it wriggled like a living ribbon, science inherited a paradox. It was a creature that grazed like an animal and, under the right light, fed like a plant. It forced biologists to ask whether the line they had drawn was ever a line at all. The most famous of these paradoxes is a small sea slug found along the Atlantic coast of North America. It looks improbably like a leaf, with ruffled edges that catch the current and a body colored the kind of green you see in a spring hedge. Its name is Alicia chlorotica, and it belongs to a group called Sacoglossins, small snails that suck the contents from algae. Alicia does not merely rob its food, it keeps part of it. After eating strands of a yellow-green alga, it steals the chloroplasts, the microscopic solar panels that algae use to turn light into sugar. The slug stores those chloroplasts in the cells of its own body. For months, the chloroplasts keep working, powered by sunlight that falls on the slug's back. The animal becomes a solar-powered grazer. It spends long hours exposed to sun and, like a plant, survives stretches without eating. From one angle, this is theft. The slug takes hardware it did not build and runs it. From another angle, it is a kind of improvisational evolution. Chloroplasts are not just lenses and pigments. They are the descendants of ancient bacteria that took up residence inside other cells over a billion years ago. In algae and plants, millions of years of gene transfer and coevolution made the partnership stable. The stolen plastids inside Alesia are not so secure. They lack the full support network that a plant cell provides. Yet, they last. They photosynthesize long enough to alter the life of an animal. The slug behaves like an herb that learned to graze. The first discovery raised as many questions as it answered. If you can plug chloroplasts into an animal and keep them running, what else can be borrowed across the line? Do chloroplasts need to be told what to do by genes in the nucleus, or do they carry enough instruction within themselves to function for a season? Is the slug's genome unusual in helping the plastids survive, or does the slug simply choose algae whose gear is especially robust? Does the animal truly live on light, or does the light merely subsidize a diet in lean times? Researchers tested slugs under different light regimes, under different nutrient conditions, and found an answer more interesting than a simple yes. Light helps. In some circumstances, it helps a lot. When nitrogen is scarce, the photosynthate produced by the borrowed plastids can be the difference between growth and stasis. Light becomes a currency the animal can spend. If that was bizarre, the next discovery went further by showing that the slug was not an isolated experiment. Other Sacoglossin slugs steal chloroplasts too. Some hold them for days, some for weeks. A handful hold them for months, enough time to change migration, breeding, and survival. Scientists call the trick kleptoplasty. The word feels like a joke until you realize how many times nature has committed the same theft. The green hydra, a small freshwater predator, hosts algae within its cells and glows the color of its guests. Certain single-celled animals, such as Paramecium bursaria, shelter green algae in their cytoplasm and feed on sugars the algae make, like a farmer living with harvest in his kitchen. Reef corals build entire limestone cities by partnering with dinoflagellate algae trading a safe home and minerals for the energy that sunlight unlocks. Giant clams lay their shells open like books to the sun and host algae in their tissues, their colors, the colors of their partners. A spotted salamander carries algae within its eggs, and the embryos grow faster when the algae flourish. Fed by the carbon dioxide and nitrogen, waste the baby salamander's exhale. The world is full of animals that rent sunshine. The boundary between plant and animal began to look less like a wall than a permeable membrane. Some creatures cross by stealing organelles, some cross by hosting entire cells. Others walk down the middle and eat when there is food and photosynthesize when there is light. The simplest of these are protists that carry chloroplasts, and yet will happily swallow bacteria and other protists whole. Their lives are calendars that switch between hunting and harvesting. In the ocean, such mixotrophs are not rare commas in a long sentence of plankton. They are a large part of the grammar. Where nutrients are thin and light is plentiful, it is costly to be only a plant that cannot move, or only an animal that must capture prey. A little of both wins. Experts debated the meaning. Some argued that true haves do not exist here, only animals with servants or borrowed tools. After all, 
a sea slug with chloroplasts is still a sea slug. Its cells have no walls, it cannot use nitrogen from air, it must eat to acquire new plastids. Others believe these partnerships blur the definition enough to justify the seductive phrase half plant, half animal. On land, we draw a line between organisms that build bodies from sunlight and those that build bodies by swallowing others. Under microscopes and in tide pools, life writes a more flexible sentence. A coral polyp is an animal whose daily budget depends on a plant in its tissues. A salamander embryo grows within a green nursery. A slug grazes and then becomes a leaf. No explanation fully fits the urge to classify without losing the richness of what creatures actually do. And then came the most unbelievable discovery of all. In some organisms, the boundary did not merely blur, it left a fossil. Certain algae in the sea carry not just chloroplasts, but leftover nuclei from algae they once ingested in the distant past. Those tiny nuclei, called nucleomorphs, sit captive between membranes, a memorandum of a merger that happened so long ago that the partners are now one. What modern plant biologists call a chloroplast began as a captured bacteria. Later, some lineages of algae captured other algae. Endosymbiosis piled on endosymbiosis. When you look at a strand of seaweed or a tree leaf, you are looking at a long record of living things moving into one another and staying there. Against that deep background, a sea slug that borrows chloroplasts for a season looks like a small echo of an old revolution. This forced researchers to rethink more than a few headlines. If the most durable innovations in the history of life came from such mergers, and if temporary, seasonal mergers can give animals enough of a plant's powers to change their prospects, then the idea of a clean split was too simple. The creature that was half plant, half animal is not a single species, but a theme that runs through the tree of life like a seam of ore. Sea slugs are showy, corals are architectural, protists in the open ocean are armies of account keepers, deciding hour by hour whether sunlight or hunting pays better. The boundary is an axis scribbled over by millions of experiments. From there the story widened to include how such experiments matter for the planet that hosts them. Mixotrophs affect how carbon moves from air to sea and back. When a single-celled organism both grazes and photosynthesizes, it changes the fate of the carbon it ingests. It can package carbon into heavier particles that sink or recycle it at the surface. In the dim blue of the mid-ocean where nutrients are scarce, flexible metabolisms can dominate the calendar of who eats whom. This means the global carbon pump is not driven only by pure photosynthesizers at the base and pure animals above. It is tuned by shapeshifters. Climate models do better when they account for the ambiguity. Meanwhile, in shallows where we can see them with our own eyes, the partnerships that borrow sunlight reveal their fragility when the world warms. Corals blanch when heat lasts too long. The algae that dwell within them leave or die, and the limestone skeletons turn white. The animal half loses its plant half. Reefs turn from engines of life into tombs. The sea slug's trick has its own limits too. The stolen chloroplasts need replacement with time, and slugs must find and feed on the correct algae to restock their panels. The salamander's green eggs rely on clean water and stable ponds. For every boundary crossing, there is a dependency, and for every dependency, there is a risk when conditions shift. A closer look at Elysia chlorotica sharpened the lesson. For a long time, a simple story circulated in popular writing. The slug must have stolen not only chloroplasts, but also genes from its algal food to keep those chloroplasts working. The truth turned out to be messier and more interesting. Some early studies suggested algal genes were present in slug DNA. Later work argued that they were not, that the signals detected were contaminants or transient pieces of RNA rather than inherited modifications. The plastids seem able to limp along for months using a combination of internal reserves and perhaps proteins the slug cells supply for other reasons. What the controversy really shows is that biology at boundaries is easy to romanticize and hard to measure. Whether or not gene theft underwrites the trick, the fact remains that an animal can live long enough on light to incline its life toward the Sunday. Theories multiplied to explain why half measures persist. Some researchers pointed out that evolution favors strategies that work often enough, not strategies that are pure. In a variable world, the ability to switch between light and food gives insurance. Others suggested that some partnerships begin as theft and end as union. A predator that spares an organelle in its gut for a while may, over millennia, spare it in a special cell, then inherit it, then restructure its genome around it. 
The chloroplast in plants is the fossil of a theft that became a marriage. Kleptoplasty could be a trial marriage, a seasonal arrangement that could, given time and population and patience, become permanent. There is beauty in the idea that a thousand small temporary borrowings can add up to one of the great inventions of life. Picture a tide flat at noon and let the light write the next part of the story. A slug like a leaf ripples its parapodia to spread its surface. Only a few millimeters away, a young oyster filters a liter of water an hour and begins to take on algae in its mantle. In a shallow pool, a green hydra extends its tentacles. In the open water beyond the sandbar, a thousand protists choose their metabolism based on the hour and the chemistry of the moment. None of them knows they are erasing a line we drew. None of them cares about our categories. They do what pays. Despite the romance, there are limits we must say out loud. No animal makes its own nitrogen fertilizer from the air the way plants and cyanobacteria do through symbiosis with bacteria. No animal builds a cell wall of cellulose like a tree. No plant has a nervous system that fires muscles to leap across a reef. Hybrids here are hybrids of function, not myths where half the body is leaf and half is lion. The surprise is not a monster but a portfolio. An animal can carry a plant's solar panels. A plant can house an animal's partners. A protist can move along the continuum. There is a useful humility in realizing that what we call plant and animal are chapters that appeared late. Before leaves and mouths, there were single cells learning to burn fuel with oxygen single cells learning to build batteries out of light, and single cells learning to swallow other cells whole and not digest them. The creature that was half plant, half animal, is a memory of that earlier world delivered in living packages. It is also a preview of worlds that might be. If life exists on other planets where light falls through thin atmospheres onto seas poor in nutrients, the bland line between photosynthesizers and predators may never harden. The first animals we meet through a telescope may be nothing like animals, and the first plants may move faster than vines. For now, we can only do what the sea slugs and corals have done forever. We make use of what is at hand. Scientists borrow tools from physics to measure light in cells, and from chemistry to trace where carbon goes once sunlight hits a chloroplast. They borrow ideas from ecology to see how a billion small boundaries blur into a global pattern. The result is not a single headline creature, but a network of lives that solve the same problem in different ways. How do you stay fed when light and food come in pulses? How do you persist when nutrients are scarce? How do you buy time? Across all these discoveries, one truth stands out. Life would rather bend a rule than break. It would rather enlist a neighbor than invent from scratch. When the line between plant and animal gets in the way of a good living, life writes over it. We notice this most easily in charismatic cases a neon green slug basking on a blade of eelgrass, or a lighthouse coral that goes dark and then bright again after a storm. But it is also true in the less visible places where most of the world's carbon is won and lost. Every time a mixotroph chooses light at dawn and hunting at dusk, the planet's budget changes by a decimal we can measure, and all the decimals add up. Which of these boundary crossers do you find most astonishing? The leaf that crawls, the coral that farms, the single cell that, like a shopkeeper, opens two counters, and serves whichever customers arrive. Each is a reminder that our categories are maps, not the territory. They are useful until they are not. The real territory is a coast where tides need chemistry, a reef where animals carry gardens within them, a pond where embryos grow under a thin green light. We live in a world made by such arrangements, and if we hope to keep it, we will have to honor the bargains that built it.